Well, guys, welcome. Um, you're here for dating and sex, and if you're not, well, then you're in the wrong place, because that's what we're going to talk about is um, dating and sexual relationships, and uh, especially for you guys in the high school uh, age group. Um, I just want to double check. Is there anybody here that's in middle school? Because if so, we might direct you to go to a different session. So we're going to talk about some. All right, some other things. Okay, great. Um, all right, we're going to start out. Um, really, we're going to start right out with your questions. So here's what I want you to do. Um, who has their phone with them? Great, take out your phones. Whoever says that, right? What, what monitor are you ever supposed to take out your phones? Take out your phones. And here's the number I want you to give you. All right? 864 979 8720. That's my number. 864 979 8720. This panel is going to be run by your questions. So, you text me any question, and we're going to try to answer it as best we can. All right, if you don't get any questions from you guys, and I've got other questions that, that we can add in, but we really want to be able to answer what you want to know about. And we want to be able to give you responses from God's Word and uh, point you back to Jesus. So start texting me, um, 864-979-8720, if you have any question. And I'll try to, um, to give you that number a couple times throughout our session here. But we're going to start out, I want to introduce you to our panelists. We've got uh, some people that have been married recently, some people that have been married a long time, and some in between. So um, I'm going to ask the panelists, um, would you guys introduce who you are, and how long you've been attending North Hills, and how long you're married, and how long you dated it for. So Connor, let me start with you. Yeah, sure. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, so we're in the cross, I'm Connor. Uh, we've been at North Hills for two years. Uh, we're married for one year, we dated for 11 months. And... So my name is Gabriel, this is Jessica. Um, we've been at North Hills, well, I've been at North Hills less than her. I've been at North Hills a little bit over like a year and a half, I think. And then you've been at North Hills for like five or six years. Yeah, um, and we dated for six months, and we've been married now for eight months. So there are new ones. Yes. <laughs> All right, our season veterans. So we're, we're winning. Right? <laughs> so we've been married. I'm with Bill Martin, my wife Tracy. We've been married for 30 years. We've been in North Hills for 30 years. It was the first year we ever visited right after we got married. What's the last question? Uh, how long did you date? We dated for about three years. Not one in the long <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so you've got some, you've got a, a whole spectrum of, of people that you can ask questions to. All right, so, panelists, before we get into the questions, because I feel my phone vibrating, so I know that students are asking questions. Um, I want to know, um, let's see, how did you know that your spouse was the person you were supposed to marry? Yeah, so when we started dating, I was a new believer. Um, so I kind of wrestled with like, am I dating this person for my own interest or for God's interest? But um, in short, when I went into the relationship, I came in with a mindset like, if nothing terrible happens in this dating process, I will marry. So I went in with a mindset knowing that this is it, or it's not, uh, not really a correct moment, but yeah, it's more of a decision. Before we go into the text, I'm going to text the other one. Uh, how did you meet? Uh, so we met at the at a fight, uh, a Muay Thai fight. Um, so we both go uh, kickboxing. Yeah, so it's like high kickboxing. So we we met at a fight, and uh, we were watching this fight, and I knew they were chicken wings, and then we didn't talk for six months or something like that. And then we still started going to the same gym, and then later we talked, and then we got married. Okay, that's it. All right, Jamie. Uh, so I knew. I knew Connor, like, I wouldn't say, like, I knew, like, he was the one, you know, like, I feel like I knew that he was a good person to marry when he, like, when I saw, like, his desire for spiritual things, like, so me and Connor, like, we don't really, we didn't have anything in common except for, like, going to the same gym, um, we, like, he's younger than me by, like, four years, so, like, we never really, like, we weren't interested in each other in that sense until like, we started talking about God and then we realized like, you know, that was something that, that would go deeper than just, you know, like, being the same age or, you know, having the 
stakeholder background, but that was how we so we met through mutual friends, um, and it was kind of a friend group that was more so here in North Hills, and then I knew the, some of the people from high school, and I just started coming to some events, and I met Jessica there, and so that's how we met. I knew that she was the one, well, I'm not going to say that. I knew I wanted to marry her because I saw her relationship with the Lord. I saw her heart for serving in the church, and um, I really liked her. We started dating, and then I saw her demonstrate a lot of the attributes that I was looking for in a wife, and she, um, and so I would say that's how I, how I knew, so. Um, I knew that I was going to marry Gabe uh, when he led the relationship with Clarity. Um, I never really questioned, like, if he liked me or, like, where we stood with each other. He just was, like, even just on our first date, he's like, this is where I want to take you. This is the time. Like, it was just always very clear, and I appreciated that uh, leadership because it allowed me to just, like, relax in that sense. Um, I didn't. We were in college. I didn't think tons of people, but there was different people that were asking me out or whatever. But we met, and I just found myself like I didn't care about anybody else being Like I wasn't wondering about that guy, about that guy. That guy's cute. They don't want to date him. I just didn't care anymore. Like I I enjoyed his company. Um, I looked forward to seeing him. Um, we we sit and talk because we couldn't do much else because we went to Buff Jones. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and so we would just we, he hated the dating parlor. He was not sure so we never went but you know we just we would sit together on a bench outside and I just looked forward to that and I didn't care about all the other options walking around anymore I just felt like you know what this is this feels right it's comfortable it's good it's, it's <coughs> so mine's kind of practically simple like that too I, I realized at one point that I only wanted to experience things with Tracy no matter what we were doing if I was Skiing and saw a Vista, I wanted her to see that Vista. If I was mountain biking, if I was um, doing something very simple that I was impressed with or that I enjoyed, I only wanted to enjoy those things with her. I didn't really care about what anybody else saw or said. Everything we experienced, I wanted to experience together. And that was kind of when I realized, okay, that's, that's a good sign that I feel. All right, so we're going to open up the questions um, from here on out. And anybody can answer it. It doesn't have to be in a certain order. It doesn't have to Everybody, so you just answer as you feel like, oh, wow, like I feel like I need to get your responses. So, here's question number one What are important topics and boundaries to discuss before committing to dating? Now, I'm assuming since this is a texting question, uh, it's to discuss maybe we can answer both like maybe discuss with parents or mentors and discuss with a potential person you want to date. So, let's because uh, I'm not really sure. You know who they're addressing that to, but let's go ahead and try to get both angles. So, what are important topics and boundaries to discuss before committing to dating? Connor, go ahead. Yeah, so when we started dating early on, we had a conversation about boundaries, and we talked about abstinence. That was like the biggest thing we talked about. Like we set this boundary, like, um, one of the biggest boundaries we set is that if we are in the same room, like, because I would go over to her house and hang out. Whatever, but we would never go on with that. That was like a boundary. It's a very practical boundary, right? Because we went into our dating and with the goal of, you know, of seeing, which in a way is a goal, and for a lot of people, it's a very lofty goal, like it's very difficult, right? But um, yeah, so very early on, I would say abstinence and sexual purity is one of the probably the earliest conversations you have. And if your partner has a negative reaction to that, it shows their heart. Anyone else on that particular topic? We had a similar conversation where we set boundaries for abstinence. Um, and, you know, there's also spiritual boundaries, I think. You know, for instance, if you're a man in a relationship, I, you, know, you shouldn't start leading the woman spiritually, I don't think, while you're in the dating phase. And so that was one thing I was really clear on, that I wasn't going to lead you while we were dating. Uh, something for marriage. So there's there's more, you know, there's boundaries that you set for marriage outside of just physical boundaries. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that's a good question. 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 I think that's a good question
boundaries. And we just mean the, like the intimacy part of like really doing deep Bible studies together. Like that we wanted that to be still separate before we got married. Not he still like led me spiritually, but just more so like the intimacy of that. Billy Tracy, would you guys know, speak into the idea of like how do they broach this subject with their parents? Like topics that they should be talking to with mom and dad um, before they start dating. <laughs> Um, one of the things um, we instituted with our kids, we called it a Jedi meeting. Um, and sometimes we would call it Jedi meeting, sometimes the kids would call it Jedi meeting. And it basically meant we have something important to talk to you about, or they had something they wanted to talk to us about. And it was never in a time of conflict, it was never in a time where spirits are you know, frustrated. But we just would say, hey, Tuesday at 7, are you available? Yes, 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 okay, we want to have a Jedi meeting. And then we are called it, you know, hey, this is what we want to talk about, this is what, you know, I feel like we want to say. Sometimes it would just be advice, sometimes it would be, hey, we see this going on in your life and we don't really think that's great. Um, so uh, a Jedi would seem like a very simple, practical, you want to get to us, you want to talk to us something about us, and we come into it knowing we have, we have ears to hear it and we're, you know, kind of open. Okay, what advice would you give to them if their parents have never done a Jedi meeting before? Oh, maybe it's very easy. You say, hey, I heard this thing about a Jedi meeting, and we're taking time, we're going to be three days together, and I just want to tell you something. And, and you just, I mean, if you have to bump through it the first time, it's, you know, that's okay, you've never done it. Um, but, and some of ours were great, and some of ours, you know, were kind of like, okay, well, that's like a cracker. But, um, but we kind of, as we went along, remember, we've been married for 30 years, so, as we went along and our kids got older, it became more of a, okay, so we need to get together, we want to talk. And it could be anything from how to get to college to, I've got this boy and I really want to know what you think about it because the last one didn't work out. So now I, you know, I really want to hear what you have to say about it. All right, question number two. How do you know if you're ready for a relationship? How do you know? How do these guys know? Does it First and foremost, okay with your parents. I mean, they're, you know, the authority in your life uh, right now as long as you're under their household. I think that's the most important thing. And you know, your parents have a lot of wisdom, um, or whoever your uh, guardian is. Um, uh, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing I would say is um, I would assess your spiritual life with your walk with God. Um, how are you doing in, like, how are you living out singleness? Um, like, are you content? And I know that can be kind of um, hard to assess, but I would just really walk through that with your parents and uh, other people. Um, I think that's good. Yeah, that's good. So, going along with what you said, but what's interesting, I, me and my mom butted heads like really hard. Like, we fought, and it was like, really bad while we fought, because my mom is a Korean, so she's very, like, traditional values, things like this. So when she learned that she was four years older than me, we fought like crazy. So I was at odds with my mom, but like, I would say, so I, if I had to listen to her, I would never have dated or been married to her, right? So I think it's very, very important to, you know, like search yourself, search your own heart, your own, like you need to honestly ask yourself like what are your intentions and motives, right? And you need to ask yourself like, why am I dating? Am I dating to be married or am I just dating for self gratification? So if I had to ask myself that, and I could honestly answer, like, I'm dating to marry this woman, then that's what I need to marry myself. And you were also an adult at that time, right? You were not a teenager. Yeah. So you had the. Exactly. Yeah, so you, you had the, um, the ability to be able to make your own decisions on your own with dad. So did. Um, um, so it's just a little bit different situation than for what for where they would be, right? About making their decision or whatever. But I think that's good for if they end up, you know, waiting to date until they are past eighteen and they become adults. And what do you how do you differ with your mom and dad? And I think that's great advice there. I think that's great. Um, anything else? All right. How do you uh, how do you know you're in a relationship? Martins. So we when our kids were younger, we didn't really have a where we said it's okay to date. We didn't really have a, a maturity point. We just encouraged them to spend time with people that they liked. So if 
if, if our governor Robin was spending time with that boy, and she liked spending time with him, and thought that was great. And, and as their relationship got stronger, or deeper, or more progressed, it was not, I'm ready, I'm not ready for this landmark. It was just very casual. It was just two kids that were both believers, enjoying each other's company, and getting to know each other. And there were times where, you know, okay, he is my boyfriend, or we are Facebook official, or whatever they, whatever they became, happened. But it wasn't necessarily a, you are 16, you are ready. We just let it be organic, we let it be natural. We, we saw it as parents. Um, so we just let it be a little bit more, a little more chill. And it was safe. Oh, it's always safe. It was, it was usually, as they're getting to know each other, for the moment, he'd come over to another house, you know, bring a couple of friends. So it was always under our roof when they were younger, so we could kind of get a feel for the person they were bringing in. But, you know, it wasn't like, oh yeah, take her out, or we'll just be back on there. Like, it was, you know, come on over. You want to get to know her? We think she's great. So, come get to know her, and under our roof, we'll get to know you about a night, whatever. Um, okay, Dave, off of that question, just a little bit more specific, would it be why, would it be a wise decision to date off of maturity or off of age? I would say maturity. I mean, Connor is four years younger than me, and, um, but his spiritual maturity like, spoke volumes when I saw him, you know, he's a really good godly person to date. Um, and I think like a good way to assess if someone is like really for a relationship is also like the types of questions they ask. Like for example, you know, instead of them asking like how far should we go, you know, how much touching can we can we do? Like do they ask these types of questions or do they ask um, like as this person of Jesus woman he loves me. See that the difference in the type of questions, like one is trying to push the boundaries and the other is like trying to honor Christ. So I saw honor um, asking more um, the other type of question, which is like, you know, how, how can we like love God through our community? That's good. Anyone else? Sign in on up. Um, <laughs> all right, here's one. Uh, how do you handle when a parent is super strict about dating in general, um, and in general making you feel claustrophobic and sneaky? Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? The parents that are super strict. So I know um, the first four of you dated when you were adults. And then Trace, you and Bill dated when you were well, you guys were adults too, so you all dated you all dated when you were adults. Okay, you think back, did any of you date somebody else when um, you were a teenager? And did any of you have strict parents um, or restricted parents? I know Connie, you said your mom was restricted, but that was just when you were an adult, right? Was she? It was like when I was younger, too. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, how, how do you handle a parent that is super strict about dating and it kind of makes you feel claustrophobic and sneaky? I mean, I never felt sneaky with my mom because my family and the community very bluntly. So I was just honest with my mom. Like, that's a short answer, but I think it's just being honest with your parents, right? But also, the same thing, I mean, I guess it depends on your parents, right? Yeah. But if, if your parents are believers, they love Christ, right? And they genuinely love what they're going to have their best interests. So I think, I would say the best thing is to be honest. That's what it does And I would say, like, communicate. Like, I think, like, the communication goes a long way. Talking back and forth of how, how that makes you feel. Um, and, like, and to maybe get an understanding of why, uh, they are being restricted, um, I think can really help open, um, I think that could just really help see perspective, both sides, they can see your perspective and you can see theirs. Um, I would say that, that's the best thing I could get for that. So we, we did a very conservative, very restrictive environment, so sometimes that was parental and sometimes it was church or school that we were at. Um, and so in, in hindsight, there were lots of times where if a standard was set for us here that was not our standard, we kind of felt like, like this is pretty normal, chill, like, not a big deal. Like, we were told that this was the right thing to do. There would be, there would be tension there. You know, and sometimes tension can feel like rebellion and you can kind of feel weird about, I really want to do the right thing, but I don't think that has to be it yeah, necessarily. Um, when we're younger children, you're called to obey your parents. And as you get older, you're called to honor your parents. And, and, and that idea of obeying or honoring can also be translated over to whatever authority 
you're in at a particular time, whether you're at home or you're in school. And so committing yourself to being honorable, obeying and or honoring your parents is an enormously important part of where you're, you are at that phase of life. Um, but then understanding that, that you shift from your parents' rules to your own standards. And as you move through high school and into college, that's a huge change. And so understanding that there is a time where I may just need to obey, and there may be a time where I need to honor my parents, but I might not do exactly what they said, because you started to, to become your own conviction of what you truly believe in yourself. And so navigating that with just a good, clean conscience and having some confidence about where your own standard is does, does become important. I'm, I'm never sure that there are things that we did that our parents would have been wrong or something. But we didn't feel like it was necessarily wrong for us to do it. We didn't want it or we weren't rebellious about it, but we were developing our own standards, developing our own relationship. I think I would, if I can just really quick, kind of flip the coin, and I would say, be honest with yourself and really think, are you, is your, are your parents or your mom being claustrophobic and sneaky? And if, if are your parents really being claustrophobic and over the top of you, or are they just not letting you do what you want to do? So, I mean, when you're, we are all the kids under our parents, right? We are all young, and, you know, your parents are like, oh, come on. Like, we got the eye rolls, we got the whatever, the huff and puff out of the room. But I was just challenging you to just kind of stop and be like, okay, am I, am I just frustrated because they're not letting me do what I want to do? Or are they really being claustrophobic, which is causing me to see? Like, just kind of set that, you know, basis for yourself right up front. Do they just love me and they're trying to help me be the best I can and I'm just fucking the system because I'm a kid, that's what I do. I was just going to add, um, I love the idea of doing a Jedi meeting for something like that. If you can come to your parents with a receptive heart and just express what your thoughts are on whatever the strictness is, um, I think that can do a lot of good. So. I want to build on another question here that's really good, but um, what is your advice for working with parents that don't like you? What is your advice for working with parents that don't like you? And I'm assuming it is in the context of dating, a dating relationship. How do you work with parents that you feel like don't like you? Like, no, um, I'm assuming that I'm assuming that the student or whoever wrote this um, feels like their parent doesn't like them. How do you work with somebody that doesn't like you when it comes to this is what I'd like to do in dating? That's a lot of prayer right there. Um, you just need to lay it at the throne and just ask God, what, what do I do here? How do I move forward? How do I honor my parents or my mom or my dad? And, I, and if I don't feel like they love me, because it's not a mistake that you're their child. It's not a mistake that you're in the world. God has a perfect plan for everything. Um, so I would, I would start with prayer first and foremost and just how do I move forward? Because, I mean, our own, our, our own um, knowledge is just so finite. And, and God is immaculately full of wisdom, and you just ask for the wisdom, He will give it. And He says it all the time. If you, if you like it, ask me. I'll give it to you. And that's just, you know, that's a good starting point. And then I just would pursue a relationship with that person, spend time together, invest in that person, um, time, effort, good quality time. Where those relationships, you know, almost have to grow. It's so many of you. And you're referring to parents, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So investing in your parents, which is something that's not often done, I think, with teenagers, is like making a concerted effort to be with mom and dad. So I'm going to switch to this. Okay. All right. We're going to switch to um, a little more of the nitty gritty with um, dating. Um, how can you tell if someone likes you? How do you know that? Jermaine, how did you know that Connor liked you? He kept texting me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not their views, are just saying. Yeah. He was persistent. <laughs> okay, but let's, let's dig into that a little bit and feel like you can answer. Um, like, what kind of text, you know, is it just like, hey, what are you doing? Or is it like, you know what I mean? Like, or was he actually asking you questions? Or like, what kind of, what does a relationship look like? Because right now, I mean, we all do a lot on our phone, we text a lot. So what was the difference between him texting, that you that he liked you? Uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be like 
like how are you or who can like more be like statements like oh class is really hard. I was like trying to start a conversation, you know, I could tell. Um, but no, no, it's okay. It's alright. Um, anyone else? How do you know? Um, how do you tell someone likes you? Well, I gotta be honest with you, for me, uh, I kept on picking up hints that Jessica was not giving, and I was just reading way too into stuff, like constantly before we started dating. So I did not actually know if she liked me until we went on our first date, and even then, you know, it was a first date, and she, you know, I don't think she had thought of me romantically before that. So for me, it pretty much took her saying, Game, I like you. So for me, that's what it. It may just be, you don't read into the heads. Like, I'm not, I cannot pick up on heads, so. Okay, but is that a male thing, or is that just a, a thing in the situation? Yes, it's a male thing. I think <laughs> it might be a little bit of a male thing. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, yeah, I, I forgot, Connor also um, cooked me an, an entire dinner of Korean ginseng chicken, so I mean, he, like, he put in a lot of effort to make that full meal for me, so it was pretty obvious that Sure. <laughs> okay. Get my Jessica. Yeah, like he didn't just say, "Hey, what's up? What are you doing?" It was intentional questions, like, "What do you think about this?" I read this in the Bible today, like, or saw this, like, or what are you interested in? It's more like pursuing questions, not just like, "What's up?" So I think that was a big key indicator. Was it Martin's? <laughs> he asked me on this. He asked me on this. Yeah, I just needed to take a new option. So, I mean, we didn't have, this is going to blow your mind, we didn't have cell phones back then. Because it was a dumb dumb. So, it was the dumb system at night. We didn't write the notes. And, and, uh, we didn't live near each other when we got home. So, it was all just whatever we could do with. Okay. Love it. All right. Um. How do you ask someone out? Oh. <laughs> Listen, you use your character. Like, what do you like to do? It could be cute. It could be uh, silly. It could be just a legit. Hey, don't text it, though. Please, people, don't text it. Thank you for that mom of that. See that girl mom? Boys, don't text a girl and ask her out. Um, but use your imagination. Every boy has got an imagination. I have a boy. I know in his imagination. Like, use your imagination. Make it fun. Make it encouraging. Make it exciting. Love it. How do you ask I think practically, I very much agree. You need to call or ask in person. I don't think you should text. And then I think just advice to the guys if you're asking a girl out, um, I think you need to have a time and a, a, whatever the activity is, and then you need to say, hey, I would be interested in going on a date with you. Would you be available to do those two things or to go on this date at this time? And you need to be very specific and clear and to use the word date. It's a lot of, you got to use the word date or else it's not clear. Well, you got to be a member here. You got to use the word date. Use the word date, guys. Use the word date. Clarity is kindness. Yes. Lauren, say it again, Lizzie. Clarity is kindness. Clarity is kindness. That was Lauren Mayer, ladies and gentlemen. Lauren Mayer. It's your own thing. Oh, you went Um, Connor and Jermaine, how do you ask me up? Um. Maybe we created it in the wrong of your house. That sounds great. I would just say bluntly, just be honest. If you want to date them, and like the worst thing they can tell you is no. And also, if you want to go out, like, no, I'm like, okay, well. Don't do something formal. You know, do what you like. You love hiking. 
and would you like to go on an active leave you've never done seat to a setting before, let's go do it. Do something that you enjoy so you can be yourself, be in a natural environment, and then this person can get to know the real you, not the not performance version. Hey, that's your worst your date um, that you guys went on. Maybe with your spouse, maybe not. But that's your worst date. To see someone. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear Bill, he said they've all been great. So that's wonderful. That's the worst date, real fast. Uh, Korean dinner was the best date. Excellent. What's your worst date you're going on? I mean, like, what, what kind of activity did you do that was your worst date? I'd say in movies, you don't really talk to the person. Okay. My favorite was, uh, we weren't dating at this time, but he invited our friend group to go swing dancing, and I had her swing dance. And it was really fun, because like, you know, it's fun, because you get to dance, do whatever, and like, there's a tons of people there, it's high energy. I thought it was really fun. My favorite date was, um, we got up really early and drove to Pretty Place really early on, and watched the sunrise. So, so fun. Um, my daughter is dating somebody, and uh, their first date was he asked her to go thrifting, and they went thrifting, oh. and they went thrifting and ice cream. In fact, she was one like she had been asked that on a couple different dates by a couple different guys, and she's like, I should really want to go with this guy because he did something different. It wasn't like dinner and weed or whatever. It was birthday and ice cream. And she's like, that sounds cool. Let's try it. They're dating and probably gonna get married, so that's kind of cool. So, um, okay, let's see. Well, we got a deep question here, people. Deep question. How do you help a friend? that is looking for sex, like a friend that is waiting for an opportunity with their partner? How do you help a friend that is looking for sex? I guess, um, I think the question is asking, like, like has a propensity for that, like he's desiring sex, and is just waiting for an opportunity to have sex with their, with their partner. We're getting into sex. If, the, if your friend is a uh, fellow believer, because I feel like if your friend isn't a believer, you know, he doesn't accept the Bible as his final authority. Um, but I, I guess like, if your friend is also someone who claims to be a Christian, I guess like reminding them, you know, like God just tells us to flee from sexual immorality in the Bible. Um, so I would start there. So I think the Bible gives us a model to follow. You know, if, if any of us are, are tripped up by something, we should go one on one. So I can go talk to that person myself and say, hey, you're about to get caught in this. If they don't respond to me, I'm called to bring a friend with me. So we're going to go together and talk to you. And if that doesn't work, I can bring I can bring a leader from the church to come with me, and I'm going to pursue bringing that person forward. And if they respond one-on-one, -on -one, just me and a friend, or I have to escalate that. It's something that's worth, that's worth escalating for, for sure. So go along, bring a friend, bring a church a leader, counselor, from, from the group, or bring somebody to be on that. But, but you can see it coming. Pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Gabe, are you going to I was going to say that exactly. Oh, yes. All right. Um, let's talk about um, why it's important to abstain? Um, I think that's a little bit of that is implied in that question. Is like, what is it that? Um, because every TV show we watch, every song that we hear, everything talks about um, having sex with somebody that we love. And if we are dating somebody and we think we love them, why don't we have sex with them? First and foremost, Jesus commands it. Um, I think also the emotional connection of it. Yeah, the emotional connection that you have when you have sex. It should only be with your husband and wife. Like, as a husband and wife. So that's, that's it. You can't really... So, um... Yeah, I just, I just want to ask about sex. Like, why is it important to abstain? Like, why, if, if we are a child of God, why should we abstain from sex? So, I think the most... Well, the first thing is like sex is like something you can do just like God is a gift, right? And but he describes it like a fire, right? It can either burn you or it can like warm your in the context of marriage, it can like strengthen your marriage. But like it says, I don't remember which book, but it's saying like sexual immorality is a sin that, you know, not only do you commit against God, you're actually harming yourself. You sin sexually, like you sin 
you know, sexually. And not only that, it's like, you know, as believers in Christ, right? We are like we should see other people as like God's children, especially if that other person is a child of God. If they're also a believer, it's like that person is not yours. So like that person is actually yours. It's like if you sin sexually with this person, you're sinning against God, you're harming yourself, and if you're instigating it, you're also harming their relationship with the Lord, and you, you're harming them because they're now sinning sexually, which is hurting them as well. And it's like, well, it's like, how does it hurt you? Well, there's like so many reasons. Like, like if you have sex through marriage, you're becoming one flesh, right? It says it in like Proverbs, right? Or I think in the first Corinthians, it says like, um, if you have your you know, your body is the Lord, so it's like purchased by the Lord, but you, um, it's like, should you become one flesh or heart? That's like a word he uses. But it's like, if you, if you sin sexually with each other, you're becoming one flesh with that person. And if you become one flesh with that person prior to marriage, you're in this situation where you're bonded with that person in one flesh, but then you don't have the protection of a marriage covenant. I mean, this is why, like, people that have sex through marriage with someone is bound to get hurt, right? So, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Yeah, emotionally, physically. Spiritually. And there's ramifications like going forward into the future where it's like you have sexual experiences and you know it's like you're essentially like having sex with someone else's wife if they get married. Like the first time I read that, I read that in book and it blew my mind. It's like we started dating, but like your name's not mine. She may not marry me. So it's like I was like I started like walking in culture because you're essentially having sex with someone else's wife or future wife. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons why not to have sex. And the last thing before we stop is sex also murkies the water if you're in a relationship you're having sex prior to marriage. It's like, it makes it way more difficult to separate. Because you're one flesh, right? You're one flesh with someone, and then you're with this person, maybe this person, like it's a toxic relationship, right? A lot of things, if you're having sex with this person, it makes it much more difficult to see that toxic relationship. That's just like an example. So it can murky the water, make things difficult separate it makes the sermon difficult if the relationship is wide enough. That'd be my answer. Um, I think short and sweet, just the, the very fact that sex is a gift from God. Literally it's a gift. And if you use it before it's time to open that gift, you're just really self-serving. It's what you want. It's what makes you feel good. It's you think it's fine, you can rationalize why it's okay. How I can marry this person. I mean, until that ring is on your finger, you don't know that you're going to marry that person. Anything can happen. So don't abuse the gift and don't self serve. Um, on the note that you were talking about with the, the passage, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, talking about um, how if you had sex with a harlot, it would bind you to that person. Um, <clears throat> the scientific part of that is that your body releases a hormone called oxytocin and it binds you to your surroundings. And so that bind is not only physical, well, it's not only spiritual and emotional, but it is the deepest way physical. And so if you can imagine, if you have sex before marriage and you split from that person, you're like ripping a bind physically in your in the hormones of your body. So um, I think that's... You know, it's beautiful in marriage, but it's so damaging outside of marriage. Yeah, I think it's important, students, to remember that, and we don't always talk about this in the church as we should, but what they're saying is exactly right, that, that sex is a gift. It's not something that we go, oh, we shouldn't do this, this is terrible. No, 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 in the context of marriage, it is God-given and God-encouraged, and, and God delights in that in the context of marriage. And outside of that are these things that, that our panelists are talking about. I think that's really important to remember. It is a gift, and it's a good thing in the right context. And that, that context is, when the Bible talks about the marriage bed, it's only in the context of marriage. Um, that's good. You guys have great answers. Um, what are some red flags in a relationship? If you're in a Christian home, if your parents or siblings don't like the person you're dating, that's a huge red flag. You need to listen. Well, siblings is huge. Like, when my kids were somebody, my, my oldest daughter would be dating somebody, and I would look at Dawson. I don't know if any of you all know Dawson Martin. This is our son. I would look at Dawson and say, Dawson, what do you think about this guy? Because he would see him in his natural habitat. You know, when the boy comes over, he's going to be under behavior in front of her parents. 
but when he's at school or he sees them, you know, outside of the family context, your siblings know, your close friends know, you listen to them because that's who they see the real person, not the person that's trying to impress. And also, like, welcome the, that feedback. Um, like, be ready for it, ask for it, seek that feedback. So that's really great. Anybody else have a question? Any red flags in a relationship? Um, I heard it's like for me to be like if he's disrespectful to his parents or his mom, his mom especially, because that's how he, he will treat you as the woman in the future. Listen, if he pulls up and beats at you to come out for the day, lock the door. Deadbolt it. He needs to come to the door, pick you up, reach your parents, bring your mother flowers, whatever. I mean, but the, the red flag, if he doesn't treat you like a lady, if he's not a gentleman, if he doesn't get your door, I know that sounds old fashioned, but really, boys need to get the worst for the girls. That's just a gentleman. It's just... And, and that, um, that action is not implying girls that you don't have the capacity to open your own door. Obviously, we know that you're very capable. I'm a very independent woman. Um, I've raised two independent daughters. Like, we are all very capable of opening our, door, our own doors, but it's a way that the guy can honor you and show, like, show you respect is to do it for you. Also, moms of sons have hopefully trained their sons to be a gentleman with their door. And I have two very strong little independent daughters who I have to say to them, please let the boy open the door for you because some mother has worked hard to teach them that. So, on respect. Any other red flags in a relationship? Yeah. I would say equal yoking is what I would say. You want to make sure all your partners can you explain a little bit more what you mean? Um, equally like spiritually or um, socially, mentally, like what do you mean? I would say, I mean spiritually equally yoked, know, because I mean your partner should have the same worldview as you, right? Because your partner does like your partner is more like a hedonistic worldview, like you know, just live life, do whatever, but you're like, oh like you believe in like biblical marriage and biblical men and biblical all these things, right? And this person would be from the get-go that relationship. So what if your partner is not a Christian? Your partner's not a Christian, I mean, it does say in the Bible, like in First Corinthians, it says like if your your partner is not a believer, like it's just like the believing husband, or the non-believing husband saying about the believing wife and vice versa. But also in context, he's talking about like already married couples. So but also like, when I was younger, I was a believer. So uh, looking back, I would say the wise answer would be to share with very good. All right, guys, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, what should I do if I get rejected after letting somebody know how I feel? How do you deal with rejection? We're going to end this question. How do you deal with rejection? It's God's way of telling you that it's probably someone better. So how do, you, how do you deal with those feelings, though? Like, you, you know that in your head, right? You know that, hey, God does have something better for me because I trust him and I believe him, but how do you practically deal with the frustration? So my go-to passage, sorry, I don't know. My go-to passage is, whatsoever things are lovely, whatever's good, whatever's true, whatever's honest, those are the things that you think of. And that will encompass every part of your life if you can train yourself to think that way. Um, well, I like this way you reject me. Okay, well, what do I know? I'm a good person. I am nice. God loves me. God has someone for me. And if it's not that person, thank you, Lord, for saving me from heartache down the road. A comment you said, if there's also truth in that rejection, let's say I'm, I'm not the person that I want to be, and I, I got exposed, and somebody said, hey, I, well, I'm not going to continue to date you because you're not quite what I'm looking for. There's something to learn in that as well. And so for me, self-improvement is massive. And so if I'm not the person I want to be, and somebody moves away from me because I'm not that person, I want to bolster that area. I want to be even better at that area. So you can learn from rejection as well. If it's untrue, you can say it's just untrue. But if it is true, you can certainly learn from it. Thank you. I would say one thing that always helped me was processing you know, emotions with friends. So if you have a couple of really close friends, I mean, nobody likes to be rejected at the end of the day. It does hurt. So if you can just talk about it, I think it can help move on faster. So. All right, just a one sentence piece of advice to just leave with the students for dating and, and purity 
in um, the teenagers. One, one sentence. Real quick, with everybody. Okay, who goes first? Make sure you put Jesus at the center. Um, pursue clarity. Pursue what? I'm sorry. Clarity. Clarity, yeah, that's great. I would say, um, don't date unless you can see marriage at some point. If you can't see marriage, don't date. Honor the Lord, your parents, and yourself. In a good way. Surround yourself with godly individuals, friends, parents, um, confidants, and trust their advice. But make sure that they are godly people. Dating for me, I think, is about getting to know people. And so enjoy that process. Get to know people. Find out what you like and what you don't like. And then you'll have one third and you find the person that seems to be a match for you. But enjoy the process and, and learn from other people. And then that person will be. Hey, you guys can thank our panelists.